Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 7 and is the basis for our message today. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little that you weary men and you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In Isaiah this morning, we have a very familiar sounding text. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It's a verse that when we hear it, we conjure memories and visions of Christmas programs and pageants and cute little kindergartners speaking these words. They're words of hope and words of joy, words of comfort. But that's not how they were originally heard. You see, context is everything. And even though Isaiah in our text today is giving us a vision of what is to come, he is also speaking directly into the life of King Ahaz in that specific time and place. So who exactly is King Ahaz? Well, he was a gentleman who at 20 years old took over the reign of David. He is a descendant of David and a, a line in the messianic throne, but he was very unlike David. David had a heart for the Lord, and Ahaz had a heart for the world. Ahaz was not considered a very good king. In fact, he was one of Judah's worst kings. According to Scripture, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. This gentleman was a worshiper of idols, even sacrificing his own son in a worship of idols. Scripture also tells us that he worshiped idols in all the high places and under every green tree. And he was very hard-hearted when it came to hearing Isaiah's preaching for him. So that's who King Ahaz is. Here's the context in which he is ruling. In this moment, there are two opposing armies that are pressing in on Judah. We have Syria and we have Ephraim, the northern kingdoms of Israel, conspiring against Judah. Now, Isaiah comes to King Ahaz initially with a word of relief. He says, both of these attacking kings that are threatening you will fail in 65 years. <laughs> a lot can happen in 65 years. Ahaz gets very, very upset at this news. This is a long time to wait, and there's so much going on. In fact, there's so much going on in this context that I urge you to go home this afternoon and read Isaiah's chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 to get a big, full understanding of what's happening here. But I want to drill down in one very specific issue. The king Ahaz, at his heart, was impatient and untrusting to wait on the Lord. So as the king of Judah, he's faced with a critical decision. In words right before our text this morning, Isaiah says, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. King Ahaz, wait on the Lord for those 65 years. Or take matters into your own hands. And let's dig deeper into this decision that King Ahaz makes that deals with this topic of patience. You've probably heard the warning not to pray for patience, right? And God doesn't give, snap his fingers and grant you patience. Rather, he gives you opportunities. 
to grow your patience. And those opportunities are less than light. They're usually quite burdensome and difficult. He provides you with these opportunities. And so here's the problem with Ahaz. He's under siege from Syria and Israel, and Ahaz, playing the political game, reaches out to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, for assistance. He sets up altars all over Jerusalem and makes offerings to other gods to have help. And King Ahaz, he epitomizes the condition of our sleepy, groggy, sinful human hearts that's constantly seeking other things other than God to give us security, to give us peace and safety. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, gives Ahaz an amazing opportunity, one that I'm sure all of us would love to have. He says, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. In other words, Ahaz, what would it take to get you to believe in me and trust and wait? And Ahaz says, I shall not put the Lord to the test. Sounds pretty biblical, but so can Satan when he's using God's words for evil. And see, he's appearing to look pious, but what he's really saying is, you crazy preacher, get out of my Get out of my palace because I have business to run. I have big boy people to take care of. I don't have time to wait on the Lord. Now there's this interesting moment that Isaiah changes words just a little bit. See, he goes from, Hear then, O house of David, it is too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Earlier in the text, he talks about the Lord being Ahaz's God. But here Ahaz has clearly chosen that he does not want anything to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Isaiah just simply says, why do you weary my God? Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? And then there's this whole house of David comment. He he refers back to this house of David, reminding him that you are a part of this messianic promise. And it's almost as if it's, it's, it's like he is using King Ahaz's middle name. Like when my mom would need to correct me and say, Tig Anthony Currier Colbertson. Exactly. They're like, okay, I, I'm in the wrong. I'm listening now. But that does nothing for King Ahaz. If only Ahaz could be persuaded to disengage himself from from taking matters into his own hands and trusting in the political game, then the Lord would preserve Judah. But if Ahaz links himself to Assyria, what he'll in fact be doing is taking the tiger by the tail and forging a deadly partnership that would be devastating for Judah. So in all of this, the issue is clear-cut. Do we have salvation by faith, by trusting in God to prevail and be faithful? Or do we let fear creep in and try to take matters into our own hands? Will Ahaz be saved by trust or by astute political gambles? And the dynasty of the house of David is at stake. See, from the time when Ahaz disbelieved, when he did not hear Isaiah's words, well, he and all of the other kings that would follow after him would just merely be puppet kings controlled by other countries, first by Assyria and then Babylon until eventually Jerusalem itself would fall in 586 B.C. See, the extinguished kingdom and monarchy all together So that by the time Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, was born, David's throne was almost forgotten, the kingdom non-existent, and the throne was no longer there, and the crown that Jesus would wear was not one fashioned out of gold and laden with jewels, but one of thorns that drew blood, blood that would be our own salvation. 
So we have these pressing outside forces threatening security with this opportunity to show faith and be patient and wait on the Lord or take matters into our own hands and be crushed. And before we get too hard on Ahaz, I think it's important for us to connect with perhaps some commonalities that we share with him. Have you ever found yourself losing patience with God? Has God's perfect timing ever seemed not so perfect to you? Have you ever found yourself wondering, how long will this suffering take? What if you learned that it would take 65 years? And we see in Ahaz a total lack of trust in God to save him. Now, perhaps I think he was trying to take a stab at sounding pious while also hiding his total lack of desire to trust in the Lord. He's facing down superpowers of the ancient world and cleverly thinks that he's playing them off of each other for the benefit of his nation, and he doesn't have time for this crazy preacher. Unbelief, a divided heart, an unawakened heart. And maybe that describes just a few of you in the room today impatient, struggling against what it is that God might be up to if it's not according to your will. Maybe, maybe you struggle with the idea that this whole Jesus thing is real, that there could possibly be a God who loves you so passionately that he requires nothing of you, but in fact does everything for you to save you. I mean, the news really is too good to be true. And yet it is. It is most definitely true. I don't like this portion where it says the, the uh, impatience, the impatientness of humanity wearies God. Because that's a frightful thought, I think. I can think of, of people and circumstances that make me weary. <laughs> people that I tire of. I'm sure you have people that, that make you weary and tiresome as well. What are the people, situations, or conditions that we may take as idols that make God weary? Our idolatry makes God weary. And now the text today, Isaiah is speaking directly to politicians, but we struggle on a daily basis with our own leadership, right? Are our leadership leading our country in the direction that we'd like it to go. Trusting in politics will never be the solution to our problems. And see, humanity needs to be redeemed. Humanity needs a power higher than a politician. Humanity needs God with us. And that's exactly who Isaiah promises. That we have a savior we have a Redeemer. We have a God from the highest of heavens who has come to earth to save us. The abiding truth of this passage today is that faith in the Lord and in His promises is a practical approach to solving life's problems today. Isaiah says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Here it is, a son born who will be called God with us. This is, this is ironic to me because Ahaz is given this incredible opportunity to ask for anything, sky's the limit, literally as high as the heavens, what will it take? And Isaiah speaks words of a sign that will come. Isaiah says, you... You have this opportunity to ask for anything. And so from the highest of heavens, I will send a sign. God will send a sign to you from heaven himself, God with us. Be born of a virgin and foretells the birth of Jesus Christ. The gift that humanity has desperately needed and yearned for since the third chapter of recorded history will be given as a sign to someone who refused to ask for it. Now, in the context of King Ahaz, this is not a word of gospel, but judgment, right? If God is with you and you have no Redeemer, that is not a happy place to be. 
God with us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our sin, with no Savior, is a place of damnation. But for those in faith, for those who trust and put their hope in the Lord, who have been redeemed to be in the presence of God, this name Emmanuel becomes sweet as honey because we are filled with peace and love and salvation. Before our text today, Isaiah speaks God's words saying, be careful, keep calm, be patient. Now patience, I think I probably should have said this at the very beginning of the message, but I forgot. Patience is not being procrastinating. Patience is not sitting back and doing nothing. Patience is continuing to live out the command that God has given you until that command changes. And the command that God has given to us here at St. Luke's is awakening hearts in every generation to the power of life in Christ. And that is what we are to be fervently doing as we are patiently waiting for God's plan to be fulfilled. Patience is persevering through difficulties and struggles. Here's the key without complaining. Because if you're complaining through difficulty, you're not being patient, you're just being miserable. But patience allows you to be filled with joy and peace in the midst of problems. Trust in God. If we have questionable leaders threatening war and nuclear weapons, trust in God. Soaring inflation, trust in God. Christian values being persecuted by worldly moral standards, trust in God. Even if you don't see a way out or an end of suffering in sight, trust in God. Be resilient, part of the remnant, and God is faithful to his promise to return, and you will enjoy the restoration of life, not as we know it now, but better than we could ever imagine, that lasts for eternity. And that perspective of the infinite, of the long-lasting peace that passes all understanding allows us to push away impatience and fear and doubts and worries and anxiety and to trust in the Lord. The short time of suffering that we have here on this earth will be long forgotten in the eternity of joy. Looking as Isaiah did into what is to come makes the challenges today possible to endure. Emmanuel, God is with us. And may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.